All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our third installment of the Lincoln Fellowship of Pennsylvania's Conversations with a Lincoln Scholar. Um, my name is Ashley Lusky, and I serve on the board of the Lincoln Fellowship, and I'm also the assistant director for the Civil War Institute here at Gettysburg College. And uh, we welcome you tonight to join us with uh, a distinguished guest that we have, we're very fortunate uh, to have with us tonight, uh, Dr. Martha Hodes, who is a professor of history at New York University, where she specializes in 19th century US history, race, and the Civil War. And Dr. Hodes has uh, numerous accolades to her name. Um, she has uh, taught as a, a Fulbright, she had a Fulbright, correct, in Germany uh, teaching. When was that, Martha? That was 2009. In 2009. Okay. Very, very good. Um, yeah, she was over in Germany teaching as a Fulbright. Um, and then she's been awarded numerous fellowships after that from multiple distinguished institutions uh, across the country. And uh, in addition to that, she, of course, is the author of numerous books, numerous prize winning books, I should add, including the topic of tonight's conversation. I'm sure the glare doesn't get it too much. This is Morning Lincoln, which was the 2016 recipient of the Distinguished Gilder Layerman Lincoln Prize. And in fact, I think that's where I first saw you in person, Martha, was up in New York City when you were um, giving your, your acceptance um, lecture about this. Uh, and that was, uh, it was quite an experience. Um, so she has that prize under her belt as well as numerous other prizes for other work as well. Um, she is also, in addition to specializing in teaching about race in 19th century history and civil war, uh, she's also taught a wide array of courses about the craft of writing history, which is something that I'd like to get into uh, asking her a little bit about here in just a couple of minutes. And when you go through her book and you read Morning Lincoln, uh, you definitely understand why she teaches these courses. Um, as if she doesn't have enough on her plate already, teaching at NYU and giving public presentations all across the country and even internationally, even as far away as Australia, right? That's probably the furthest that you've gone. Um, she also uh, is currently serving as the interim director at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. And she is there for two years. This is the first of her two years. So she has a lot of stuff going on um, and a lot of accolades, as I said, to her name. She's also won a Distinguished Teaching Award for her teaching skills. Um, she was winner, in fact, of the NYU Golden Dozen Teaching Award. And when was that, Martha, that you received oh, that? Oh, gosh. That I'm not sure. That was probably sometime in the last 10 years. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so very, very accomplished, very distinguished scholar. Um, we're very fortunate, Martha, to have you here tonight. I know your schedule is extremely busy, um, but we're very thankful to have you here talking about uh, Morning Lincoln. Um, I think I'd like to start off by asking you a little bit about your work as the interim director of the Coleman Center. One of the great things about Morning Lincoln is that it is a fascinating read. It makes a significant historiographical contribution, but it's also accessible to the public, which in the world of academia, that's not always the case. It's a difficult thing to do. Uh, and mastering the art of historical writing to make a sophisticated historical argument that's also accessible to the public, that takes a lot of skill. And so I'm curious, Martha, as interim director of the Coleman Center, first of all, what are kind of some of your main duties? What does the center do? And what are your responsibilities in that regard? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Ashley. I'm so happy to be here and thank you for all your kind, kind words. And I'm very happy to talk to a, a Lincoln Fellowship audience. The Coleman Center is such a wonderful place. It's um, it's called the Center for Scholars and Writers, and it really is um, both scholars and writers. And of course, the scholars who are fellows there also care a great deal about writing. So it's um, a place where 15 fellows are selected every year. Um, novelists, nonfiction writers, academics, journalists, um, translators, visual artists, um, and each fellow comes for an academic year, September through May, and each fellow has a beautiful office in the beautiful Coleman Center, which is in the beautiful and majestic 42nd Street branch of the New York Public Library. And as interim director, um, the kind of word on the street is that my main job is to keep the fellows happy. And I was a fellow there a few years ago, and I was very happy. So I am striving to replicate that 
for the fellows who are here this year and who will be there next year. And it's really a remarkable, wonderful group of people. And I'm, I feel so lucky and happy to be able to go into the library, the New York Public Library every day and, um, and foster that kind of creativity and research. Sure. Now, what exactly goes into making the fellows happy? Well, you know, part of the fellowship is about research. And so not just the scholars, the historians, but even the novelists and the poets, I should also say there are poets, um, are there to use the resources of the New York Public Library, which of course are astounding resources. And so part of making fellows and writers and scholars happy is making sure they have access to those incredible resources. Um, it's a very um, luxurious situation where you can order the books that you want to look at um, electronically, and then they're delivered to the center. Um, and just, you know, to, to foster a community, which of course the fellows do quite a bit on their own. But, uh, and of course we do have the challenge of COVID. We do have uh, mask mandates. And so um, we don't have quite the freedom of the pre-COVID fellows to mingle together in the center, but it, it's not bad. Um, it's not bad at all. People people do wear masks and talk and converse and go outside. Um, there's a beautiful Bryant Park outside the library. So we do talk about our work and um, match up all kinds of skills and ideas and inspirations. So it's really, it's, it's really a wonderful place. That's great. Yeah, to have that camaraderie and that cordial relationship with other people who are doing similar projects and even very different projects, I, I assume, is very uh, important and educational and enriching to the fellows. So a kind of a, a follow up question on that, um, which might lead us into more of your work um, as someone who teaches classes about the craft of historical writing and as someone who is now this interim director of a center that focuses on research and writing skills. What do you think are some of the, the keys to, to combining those two things, which again, as I said, sometimes they don't always match up, especially in mm -hmm. academic writing, making an important, sophisticated historiographical intervention or argument and still making it accessible to the public where you're not going so far over their head, but you're not babying them either because we obviously, the public is ready and willing to, to take on difficult arguments and complex subjects. So what to you are some of the keys that you, you emphasize in your teaching? Yeah, I think one of the things, and I also, um, this is really important for my graduate students who, who want to go on to become historians. I always use the phrase, a story with an argument. So the argument really does matter to us as scholars, an argument meaning usually what I tell my students is the best arguments answer why questions, why did something happen? And if you, and those are hard questions, why questions are the hardest questions a historian can answer. So you can also ask how questions, how did something happen? And then the key to telling a story is narrative and a narrative arc, which academics don't always think about. And if possible, strong characters. Now, some of the best history books in the world don't have a lot of characters. They might be about ideas. But overall, if people want to work with narrative, the development of characters and the development of, and when I say a narrative arc, um, and I've learned this from my novelist friends, is that everything that happens has to happen because of, of what happened before it. And then it, it builds an arc and you resolve a question that you asked. And it's interesting because um, historians often put, we put our arguments up front, but um, nonfiction writers might say, um, why give it away at the beginning? Why not build up to an argument and put it at it? put it at the end. And of course, both are completely valid forms of writing. And I also tell my students, undergrad and graduate, there's no right way to write beautifully. And also, if you want to write as a scholar and as an academic with your argument up front, that's completely fine. It's more than fine. It's wonderful. So there's no one way um, that I tell my students they have to write either a dissertation or an undergraduate paper. Sure, sure. And it probably depends on that individual skills and kind of how they approach storytelling, you know, broadly speaking, um, in terms of what works for them, too, uh, which is great to give them that that leverage and that flexibility. Um, you know, one of the great things about your book about Morning Lincoln is that you do populate it with specific characters who kind of provide a a micro history or kind of a micro lens into the experiences of very different reactions to Lincoln's assassination and different takes on mourning. And so you are populating it with characters, you're humanizing 
uh, uh, the, the event and the aftermath as well, but with a lot of complexity with a lot of other characters interwoven while still featuring uh, those two, two main families that you talk about, um, the Dormans and the Browns. Um, so to get into kind of the, the nuts and bolts of your book, let's just start out by talking about what did it mean to mourn in 19th century America and more specifically in the Civil War era? What were kind of some of the expectations for public mourning versus private mourning? What were some of the parameters that that bounded the way people expressed their mourning in reaction to Lincoln's assassination, or in fact, did not express it, uh, as you highlight in your book? Yeah, so mourning in the 19th century, right in the middle of the century there, was, it was such an interesting phenomenon for me to learn about as I was writing the book. You know there was a kind of sentimental culture, a kind of emotional, sometimes called the cult of mourning as a, a way to grieve. Um, there was also a strong current of obeying the will of God um, and um, reconciling oneself to, and I should say that in, 19, in 1865, America was a very religious culture predominantly Christian. So this sense of obedience to God's will and also reconciling oneself to the mysteries of God's plan for your own life or for the nation. There was also a really interesting strain that um, heaven was a beautiful place just above the clouds where people were reunited with loved ones. And so many of these elements were a way of um, saying to people that um, that you didn't need to be sad. And yet at the same time, of course, that's not what happened. So even though people did strive very hard and often did reconcile themselves to the will of God and did believe in a beautiful afterlife, they still, I found, this was about Lincoln, but also about personal losses, um, they still suffered terribly. And they still asked, they asked God, why? Why did you take this person away? Um, and all of those strains I thought were so very interesting, um, the way they were mixed up together. There was also, I'll just say one more thing about um, a time element so that you were only supposed to mourn for a certain amount of time. And I bring this up because one of the reasons that Mary Lincoln, the widow of President Lincoln was criticized often so heavily was because she mourned for so long, not just for her husband, but she also lost children. And she was criticized for that in a way that I think modern readers find um, almost inexplicable. Right, right. And that, I think that also has to do with something that you touched on early on in your book about kind of the transformation that people go through between the early 19th century and then the mid 19th century, and particularly in response to the Civil War, or in the early 19th century, um, notions of mourning, they're supposed to be contained. You're not supposed to have a public outburst of emotion. You're supposed to have that facade and be stoic and be martial or be, you know, even if you're a woman to, to rein it in a little bit. And then the Civil War comes along and just, you know, uproots, um, uh, upends people's understandings of death and mourning and suffering. And they have to kind of reconcile themselves to that, as Drew Gil Gilpin Faust, you know, talks about so much in, in her excellent work with this Republic of Suffering. Um, but during the, the mid 19th century, anyhow, there's this rise in that sentimentalism that you're talking about, where people feel more free or more released to express their emotions. Now, that's not to say that people just walk around, of course, with their heart on their sleeve, but they feel more able to express those emotions in public, um, which you identify with a lot of the mourners um, in, in Lincoln's case. Um, what were some of the ways that people express themselves or felt like they were allowed or encouraged to express their mourning and their sadness after the assassination? Yeah, I mean, so first I just wanna say, of course, that the scale of death in the Civil War was so much greater than anything that had happened. The number that historians give now is about um, between 720 and 750,000. And so just to put that in perspective, um, in terms of percentage of the population, it was about 2% of the population. Yeah. And if that were the case today in the United States, that would be 7 million yeah. lives lost. So it's really, really overwhelming. And so that was part of what I think um, broke down some of the expected stoicism. And then I'll also just say that um, 
Lincoln's assassination also broke down many of those rules and especially rules for men. Um, one of the most interesting facts I found all throughout my research was when the news of the assassination arrived, men weeping in public. And that was something even ministers in the midst of their sermons um, following the assassination struggled to retain their composure. So that was really different. Um, then really different from what had come before. And then just to respond to your question about how did people mourn? Wow. Um, so we have to remember, of course, that that one of the main ways people got the news was from other people. Right. So um, one of the most interesting, or another one of the most interesting things I found was that, of course, today, if we hear something like this, we all turn to social media. And before social media, for example, 9-11, we all flipped on the right. television set. And so what people did when the news came, if the newspaper arrived at your door or um, somebody knocked on your door and told you about the assassination early the mor on the morning of Saturday, April 15th, 1865, you went outside and you found other people who were also walking around outside and you looked into one another's faces because that was how you verified that it happened. Were other people weeping? Were other people looking stricken? Were other people looking horrified? And that's how you knew this was something that had actually happened. So walking the streets, looking into faces, people also dealt with their grief by recording what had happened. And of course, that's wonderful for historians. So people recorded in journals, letters, and all levels of literacy, I should say, not just the most literate classes, but um, working class people, the barely literate, um, enslaved people or formerly enslaved people um, as much as they could read or write, or sometimes people in conversation with enslaved people wrote down what those people said or thought. Um, so recording the facts and also um, another way that people dealt with their grief was through the collection of relics, mm -hmm. um, mourning ribbons or badges that people would wear um, with likenesses of Lincoln and you know statements saying something like a nation mourns, um, people collected photographs of Lincoln, whether, you know, a five cent postcard or an expensive framed portrait. Um, people wrote signs and put them in shop windows, hand lettered, expressing themselves. Um, and of course, Lincoln was shot on Good Friday right. and he died the next morning. And then, of course, that Sunday was Easter Sunday. And that was an enormous outpouring of mourning. Um, in churches. That was a way that people also dealt with their grief. They went to church. Of course, ministers had to throw out their joyous Easter Sunday sermons and rewrite those sermons for the assassination. And I think people went to church looking for answers from their ministers. Sometimes they found them, but people also wrote in their journals um, that they still remained mystified as to God's plan for the nation, yeah. as to why Lincoln was taken. At this moment, of course, there had just been the victory of the union sure. in the Civil War. So it was a very puzzling moment. Sure, sure. And of course, you talk about with the funeral train um, going from city to city and all of these people turning out. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, what, the, what this spectacle was like to see all of these people come out to just get the tiniest, shortest glimpse of the train, you know, rolling through, or if it made a stop in your town, what that experience was like? Yeah, the funeral and the funeral train was amazing. So. First of all, people put on local funerals in their own towns and villages all over the place. So that happened. The main Washington DC funeral was April 19th. And after that funeral, which was an enormous affair, was the funeral train in which Lincoln's body traveled um, from Washington all the way to Springfield, Illinois, stopping in 11 different cities. Um, I think most people think we imagine it was one single train um, moving Lincoln's body from Washington to Springfield, but actually, in those days, railroad gauges differed from one place to another. And so the funeral train um, was actually many different trains. But in any case, what you talked about, Ashley, just there was really important. The trains stopped at the major cities, the 11 major cities, but in between was really where I found the most um, moving descriptions. So the railroads published these very detailed schedules saying, you know, it might give the name of a village somewhere and say something like, you know, 2.53 a.m., the train will be passing by, it's middle of the night. 
Um, and then what would happen is people would gather by the railroad tracks. Um, sometimes the train would slow down, sometimes it would just pass by, sometimes it might stop for just a moment. Um, but families traveled to these spots with their children. It could be the middle of the night, could be pouring rain, you could be sloshing through the springtime mud. Um, people lifted their ch children up onto their shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, people felt they were participating in history. Um, you know, there are all kinds of wonderful descriptions of the hems of women's dresses becoming completely muddied, um, waking up children in the middle of the night to be part of this, just to watch the train go by. So you're not even getting a glimpse of Lincoln's body. Then, of course, when the train did stop in cities and the body was removed and people filed past it, um, that was another um, I mean, it was very majestic in a way, but what was so fascinating to me is when you read the personal descriptions of what's going on in these cities during Lincoln's funeral, I mean, there are pickpockets and women are being groped and people say, oh, I was hurried past the casket. I didn't have a chance to see Mr. Lincoln. Or people say things like, you know, by the time the funeral train and Lincoln's body is approaching Springfield, Illinois, People say things like, oh, his face looked so gray and sunken and it was so yeah. majestic. And some people say, oh, I'm glad I didn't go see the body because I heard it didn't look like Mr. Lincoln. You know, so there's it, it wasn't right. all beauty and majesty. Yeah. There was also dissatisfaction. It was too crowded. I couldn't get close enough. I couldn't hear the band. They weren't playing loud enough. Right. So it's just it's so human. And that's what I loved about reading yes. the descriptions of the funeral. Yes. No, I love those stories, finding out about the pickpockets and, you know, being jostled to the side and not appreciating, uh, you know, everyone being there trying to get that glimpse and being respectful of other people. Um, and yes, the how Lincoln's skin, you know, changes, his body changes form, the skin changes color and the features get sunken. And and the, the it was the embalmer or a, a doctor who was along the, the way trying to attend to him? Um, so there were people along the way trying to attend to him, but yeah. embalming then wasn't what it is now. And right. so it was virtually impossible to really keep his face preserved in a yeah. way that was satisfying to his mourners. Um, yeah. All kinds of people were attending to him, but but they and they were doing the best they could. Sure. It wasn't, it wasn't what it is today. Sure. And of course, I, I think a lot of people have some fleeting knowledge of the funeral train and just the enormous spectacle that this produced. And I think most people think Lincoln's assassination must have united the nation, maybe not all Confederates, but it must have united the North, certainly, that everyone would be you know, behind their grief and would be just sharing in these collective sentiments, kind of like what we think of after 9-11, which you open your book with. And your book reveals a very different story. So can you kind of walk us through um, some of the different reactions that um, we're not maybe quite as expected or by the American public today when they think about the mourning of Lincoln. Um, things that we probably wouldn't have come to mind in terms of how people responded and the the complexity that you're attempting to show and you show quite nicely through your book about how this runs completely counter to our popular image of the nation came together to mourn the father of, of the, the, the new country that had just come together. Right. So you're absolutely right about 9-11. And that's part of what got me thinking about as a as a 19th century historian about Lincoln, just in that we and I was in New York during 9-11. And we felt we felt as if the world was united. But if you went to the memorials and read the signs that people put up for days and weeks afterwards, there there was tension and there was disagreement. We should go to war. We shouldn't go to war. Um, you know, how to respond to what had happened. It was not by any means um a united front. Um, much more so, of course, the United States had just come through a civil war. And so needless to say, the assassination didn't suddenly unite the Union and the Confederacy. And I should say it wasn't North versus South. And, and you made this clear in, in your statement, but I just want to amplify this. Um, you know, Lincoln's mourners were Northern and Southern African Americans and the majority of white Northerners. And Lincoln's enemies, his antagonists, were certainly Confederates, but also um, a significant minority 
of white Northerners called Copperheads, as I'm sure some of our listeners know. They were, um, so these are Northerners who did not support the Civil War and who did not support Lincoln, and they were named after a Copperhead, a poisonous snake, but they took that name on for themselves. Um, so incredible polarization, incredible fury at the other side. Um, and I had mentioned earlier those badges, you know, where they, which would say things like the nation's loss uh, or the nation is weeping. And actually that wasn't true. The nation isn't correct, even if you're just talking about the Union or the North, because there was so much tension and so much anger. And for Confederates, wow, I mean, it was so fascinating to read these kinds of sources. Confederates often responded to the assassination with glee, and that's the name of, of one of my chapters. And so they were they were thrilled at the news. They were happy. They were laughing. They were um, mocking the Union. Now, um, that didn't last long in that they, of course, had still lost the war. But for Confederates, the tragedy was not the assassination. The tragedy remained surrender and losing the war. That was the tragedy for Confederates. And so for them, there was a momentary feeling of, um, of vengeance against their enemies and their conquerors. Um, but the palpable both glee and fury was, ran, I should say, ran through the sources so, um, so dramatically. It was really, it was really quite, quite amazing. Right. Um, and I should just say that um, Lincoln's mourners blamed Confederates. They blamed John Wilkes Booth, the assassin. They blamed the Confederate leadership. Um, and they also blamed the institution of slavery. Many, many people, and this is before Easter Sunday sermons when ministers might have made this statement, people said it is slavery that killed Lincoln, which I thought was so fascinating. Right, right, yeah, I, I did too. Um, now for those, those Confederates or former Confederates who have this glee, there are certain boundaries in certain areas where they're allowed to express it and where they're uh, forcibly coerced into either silence or coerced into um, perhaps fake mourning. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those instances, which were fascinating to me as well? Yes, absolutely. So, of course, much of the Confederacy by the end of the war was occupied by Union forces, which means that um, Northern soldiers and sometimes African-American soldiers were occupying these towns and cities. And um, there was a great deal of tension between Confederates and the Union occupying forces. Um, so, for example, um, oh, I guess, you know, like a woman in New Orleans made a really fascinating statement in her diary where she said something like, um, uh, it's, I won't get the exact quotation, but the spirit of the quotation was something like, the more we hated Lincoln, the more we decorated our windows with mourning drapes. So in other words, it was a way of saying, you know, we despised him, we were happy he was assassinated, but we can't show that because the city of New Orleans was occupied by Union forces. And so what they would do is they would put out what was called crepe, spelled C-R-A-P-E, mourning crepe, meaning um, black bunting, and they would display mourning bunting, even though they were glad that Lincoln had been murdered. Um, there were also confrontations. Um, there were confrontations between black soldiers and Confederates, and often the black men suffered in those confrontations. Um, so Confederates, some Confederates wrote in their diaries, um, you know, I just stayed inside because I, I was afraid to go outside. Even if you weren't acting gleeful, Confederates feared that Lincoln's mourners would turn on them just for being Confederates. So again, a lot of not just tension, but also violence and conflict over the assassination, a far cry from a nation in mourning. And, and the last thing I'll say about this is what's so fascinating is that Lincoln's mourners, they write in their diaries and letters, things like the whole nation, uh, the whole nation is mourning, we no longer know North nor South, we're all weeping for Lincoln. And it, it just wasn't true. And they knew it wasn't true. But it was almost as mourners, they were I think kind of like 9-11, they were just so overcome that it was impossible to imagine that the whole nation wasn't somehow united. But of course, they knew it wasn't. There had just been a civil war. Right. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, I guess that's a one of the comforting tales that we often like to tell ourselves in the event of a, a national tragedy or even a, a regional tragedy or any institution that's hit is that, of course, everyone is impacted by this and everyone is mourning it, um, even though we might know deep down that's that's not the case. But it it's comforting and it helps us cope. It's a coping mechanism to to get through the shock and the grief. And then you also talked about, which I found interesting, Union soldiers who maybe were not totally on board with Lincoln as well, who are facing coercion in camp and, and certain disciplines, right? If they don't express the proper amount of mourning for him or if they, um, if they talk antagonistically about him. Now, some manage to flout those rules and somehow get away with it, uh, which is amazing to me, especially that males could do that. Women, of course, always have a little bit more flexibility, Confederate women, just because they're not regarded as political actors. Um, but white soldiers in the Union Army who are making these statements, um, and some of them are punished, but some of them do get get away with it, um, which is, is interesting. Yeah, I mean, actually, in terms of soldiers being punished for it, and these are white soldiers in the Union Army, as you said, um, and some of them would be considered copperheads and they had been drafted um, right. into the Union Army and they were not happy about fighting a war that had become a war for slavery, um, a war for and against slavery, I should say. And so the most interesting records were these trials of yes. northern white soldiers who were brought up on charges of treason for the kinds yeah. of things they said. And so the testimony, this is these documents are in the National Archives, are so fascinating because um, they the the authorities call fellow Union soldiers to testify, and the testimony, their stories, you know, their stories about, oh, you know, all the men were sitting around the campfire, or we were washing up at the stream after dinner, and then the news arrived, and we were all saddened and shocked, and then so-and-so, you know, and they'll name one of their fellow soldiers, um, you know, said something like, you know, and then they'll give the dialogue, it'll be something like, you know, serves him right or you know good thing this ha i've been waiting for this moment you know something that was considered very um very disrespectful for the people who were in shock and in grief and mourning lincoln and so um there was also not just tension but violence between the mourners and the antagonists um some soldiers were not punished but some were um and it you know it it was what was so fascinating were the human scenes that were recreated in these documents and that in a way, I mean, this is a good moment to just to sneak in about the book that part of what I wanted to do in writing the book was write about this catastrophic event on a very human scale. Right. And that's what these kinds of scenes gave me along with the scenes written by mourners describing what they were going through. Right, right. Yeah, um, and that obviously that provides such, such texture and such fabric to the this outpouring of emotion whether it's glee whether it's fear anxiety uh grief all of that it's a kaleidoscope of emotions um which which comes to a front uh, as you paint now you had talked about the issue of blame before and people had different groups that they would blame they'd blame the entire confederacy they would blame john wilkes booth they blame southern politicians they blame slavery um but then some people also blamed themselves, it seemed, right, for their lack of morality or for their their lack of commitment to a certain cause. And that how that that interplay of, of blame and, and faith really caught my attention. Um, so I was wondering if you could could talk about that, how people could have such different reactions of blaming outwardly, saying it was all these other people's faults. And even Copperheads, of course, were suspected of being somewhat involved uh, in this plot as well. Um, and then other people could respond inwardly and say, well, we must have you know, done something wrong to, to bring this upon ourselves or, you know, God must have had a, an alternative reason uh, for allowing this to occur, uh, which, again, speaks to this notion of religion in the 19th century, which religion was so much more pervasive and faith was so much more uh, a, a guiding force in so many aspects of, of cultural life than I think people in the 21st century can fully understand today. Um, so can you talk about that, how faith became so wound up in these ideas of blame and, and trying to understand why did this happen? Could we have prevented it? What does it all mean? Yeah, I mean, of course, the why question is what people were asking. Um, these were people who had just come through a war as victorious. For African-Americans very much in particular, they had seized and won their own freedom. Mm 
Um, and this, this idea that God would take away Lincoln at this moment was so puzzling to so many people. And as I said earlier, people tried so hard and you can see this in their personal writings. They, they so wanted to be able to reconcile themselves to God's mysterious ways, but um, it was so, people found it so difficult not to ask that question. And African-Americans also along with shock and grief experienced, um, and white people did too, but African-Americans far, far more. Um, you mentioned the word anxiety and that's exactly right. Um, there's a, a wonderful, or a, I mean, a, a heart-wrenching, but but very, um, very rich scene that I found in which um, somebody describes a six-year-old African-American boy um, hearing the grown-ups around him talking and then saying, does this mean we will have to be slaves again? Right. And he, you know, maybe he heard grown-ups saying that, but, but a very serious anxiety and especially especially, you know, for African-Americans or for, for their white allies, abolitionists, who believed very strongly that, um, so first of all, I should say, everybody believed that God had a hand in right. the war and who won the war. So of course, if you win the war, um, the idea is that, you know, this was God's plan all along. And of course, we were going to win because our side was righteous. Mm -hmm. So Confederates are in a crisis of faith because they believed just as strongly during the war that God would um, have them win the war. And that was not what had happened. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that Confederates felt that moment of glee or vengeance upon the assassination of President Lincoln. Um, but this sense of, you know, and, and Lincoln himself, of course, you know, he, he makes this statement where he says in the, in the second inaugural address in 1865, um, in March of 1865, just before he's assassinated, where he says, um, every drop of blood drawn by the lash, meaning slavery, will be paid by another drawn with the sword, meaning the war will not end until slavery ends. So there's, there is, that's the kind of morality point you were talking about, the sense that, you know, we are in this moral and righteous war, and it will continue until slavery ends. And then, and then, that's what happens. And then God takes Lincoln away. So it's, um, it felt irreconcilable to many people. Um, and it was just so fascinating to read people's people of people's anguish trying to figure out what this all meant um, sure. in terms of and also the Good Friday Easter Sunday connection was just so overwhelming to so many people. Sure, sure. And even to have amongst Confederates, you talk about your one of your chapters is called uh, "Best Friend." Correct is one of your chapters. Yes, um, and the different connotations. Obviously, African Americans, many of them said, well, Abraham Lincoln was the best friend to us that we could ever have imagined uh, for obvious reasons, as especially former slaves. But even some Confederates kind of agreed too, whereas other Confederates saw this as, oh, we're finally away from the, the yoke of Lincoln and the future is so much brighter and this is vengeance for everything that's happened with Union victory. But there were some Confederates who thought, he was the best thing going for us going into the post-war years, um, which is is fascinating too. Yeah, I mean, it, it is it is a paradox in a way, so we can't as historians necessarily try to smooth it all out. But so I thought when I started reading the sources that Confederates or white Southerners, former Confederates calling Lincoln their best friend was something that came later in the Jim Crow era. You know, if you if you know the movie Birth of a Nation, yeah. which is a silent film, there's a still in which Lincoln is called the best friend of the Confederates. So I thought that was something that came later, um, you know, maybe during Reconstruction or in the post-Reconstruction era. What I found to my amazement was that the day Lincoln was assassinated, there were some Confederates who called him their best friend. Now, what they meant by that was, and this is so ironic in so many ways, but Confederates actually feared President Andrew Johnson. So he was the vice president who became president upon Lincoln's assassination. And the irony is that ultimately Andrew Johnson, although he purported to hate slavery, he hated, he was a phenomenal racist and he hated black people more than he hated slavery. So his reconstruction policies, which were eventually stymied by radical Republicans in Congress, but were, were, very, um, were very friendly toward former Confederates. But before people knew that's what was going to happen, they feared that Lincoln 
would have treated the vanquished enemies um, with greater magnitude and generosity than Andrew Johnson, who so purported to hate slavery. So it was this interesting moment um, in which Confederates did not know what was going to happen to them politically. Right. And there was also a class component to that. Am I wrong that um, Andrew Johnson hated slaveholders, right, um, yes. as well, growing up? on very poor or being raised very poor that he hated that you know, aristocracy and yes. and just kind of the arrogance of the the slaveholding class um which i'm sure also played into along with his extreme um you know racism and but you know hatred for slavery as an institution the, the hatred for for black people definitely won out um but i i found it interesting on the other side of the coin for northerners that some people breathed a sigh of relief that lincoln had been killed and these weren't his antagonists at all. So let's talk a little bit about that. Why why were there some sighs of relief even from Lincoln devotees who they found this you know shocking and horrible and 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 just awful and yet part of them was also glad uh that he had been taken away. And so you know this is so much about in some ways about Lincoln as the consummate statesman and the different faces he presented but what you're talking about are more radical abolitionists, I should say white abolitionists and, and often members of the Republican Party who worried that Lincoln would treat the vanquished Confederates too generously. Right. And so um, believed, and again, this returns to the religion point, believed that that was the reason that God had taken, <coughs> excuse me, had taken Lincoln away. Right. Because he wouldn't have sufficiently treated the Confederates um, harshly enough. And of course, they were also surprised when Andrew Johnson became, really became the best friends of the Confederate, best friend of the Confederates. Right, right. Yeah, I, I found that part just fascinating. Um, but I guess you could also blend that with something else you talk about in your book that people saw the assassination as being necessary to making sure, even African Americans, making sure that Northerners always hold a vigil uh, to make sure that Confederates don't rise to power again, to make sure that slavery is forever abolished, to make sure that the South, uh, you know, is, is is taken down sufficiently in, in its political power to not be able to recreate the situation that led to the Civil War, um, which I, I also found interesting because in my mind, I always thought, well, African Americans, of course, were just terribly aggrieved by this and just an outpouring of um, of grief and sadness and, and mourning and the best friend theory. Um, but it was also, I guess, a way of coping and finding meaning and understanding, right? That this had to happen for a reason in order to warn people that the fight's not over, that Lincoln is a martyr. He stands for this cause that we have to be vigilant, vigilant about protecting this victory uh, in order to make sure that the victory is, is permanent. Exactly. And I think, you know, I think African Americans, you know, really took the lead here in many ways and their white allies were with them in this idea that, you know, once Lincoln was gone and was a martyr, then you could take his ideas and his statements and you could make them mean what was meaningful to you. And so, of course, um, all men are created equal, a new birth of freedom. Um, these radical kinds of visions were... Um, seized upon by African Americans and their white allies, um, a strategic use of Lincoln, you could say, a very, um, and heartfelt as well. I mean, not not only strategic, but, but both st strategic and heartfelt um, as a way to uphold Lincoln as a model of the most radical possible vision for the nation. And, you know, one of the questions I always get is what would have happened had Lincoln lived? And we don't know, we do not know. Um, I mean, I would, venture easily to say that it would have been a better situation than had Andrew Johnson, than Andrew Johnson being president. But the point is that Lincoln's mourners could, could, could mold Lincoln into the vision they wanted for the nation and then put that forward um, in a way that was incredibly, incredibly important during Reconstruction and, and radical Reconstruction, and maybe even more important at the end of Reconstruction, as the nation entered the, the horrific era of Jim Crow, and people could still think back to Lincoln and imagine what he might have done and, and imagine how to realize that vision right. in the future. 
Right, right. Yeah, and, th and that gets to my, I guess, my larger question about this hyper politicization of Lincoln's assassination in the wake uh, uh, of April 14th and 15th and how people use it to such different means. It kind of always reminds me of when people can quote parts of the Bible to very different means or when people, you know, 19th century Americans would look to George Washington as well, we're the inheritors of, of Washington's legacy in the South and the North would say, well, we're the inheritors of George Washington's legacy. So people could take Lincoln and his words, especially from that second inaugural, which I'd like to get to in just a couple of minutes here, and use it for vastly different purposes. And even today, of course, Lincoln's best known words from the second inaugural, from the Gettysburg Address, from some of his earlier speeches, those are quoted time and time again to all different political purposes. And of course, all different memes that show up on Facebook and social media uh, utilized by different groups trying to make an overarching point or trying to use him for a larger political purpose. Um, so I'd, I'd like to get to some of those key phrases there in, in that second inaugural um, that stick with us even today, especially after um, big election years has certainly happened, uh, you know, last year uh, during the election season uh, when people bring up uh, the famous phrase with malice toward none and charity to all. What did that phrase mean to some of these different groups, Martha? Because a lot of people interpret it one way and a lot of people interpret it uh, very differently in the way I would we say it today too. Yeah, I would say a lot of people interpret it one way and some people interpret it another way. So right. um, the standard interpretation then and now is um, the idea that Lincoln would have shown lenience toward the vanquished Confederates. I refute that in the book, um, partly because I center African Americans and their experiences in many ways. And I was very interested to find that on the July 4th, following the assassination, African Americans marched through Washington, D.C. with a banner that said, with malice toward none and charity for all. And clearly, they were not advocating lenience toward former slaveholders or supporters of slavery. Um, and there were other statements as well, letters from African Americans in black newspapers um, that hinted at the same idea. And that idea being Lincoln meant those words to apply not to the former Confederates, but to African Americans. Um, that interpretation has not gained a lot of traction. Um, even in the current day. And I do think it's incredibly important to, to um, understand that possibility that if African-Americans were, were invoking those words, they were most certainly not referring to Lincoln's lenience or generosity against right. Confederates. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. That was, yeah, that was an amazing piece of evidence that you found there that again, I, I had not considered it uh, to be that way or to be interpretable. Uh, that way either. Um, and then, of course, he, he talks about in that speech um, was uh, the right as, quote, God gives us to see yeah. the right. And other people, of course, there are different interpretations of what exactly the right is and, and what is what is possible um, to towards achieving the right. And how are we going to go ahead and um, uh, move forward in in the in the right response to this. Do you have any insights about that? Mm -hmm. What what the right could mean to some of these different groups of people? Yeah, I mean it's so interesting that you bring that up, Ashley, because we we are all more familiar with the words that come before and after that. So what right. comes before that is malice toward none and charity for all, and then what comes after that is let us strive on to finish uh, the work we are in or something, you know, something right. to that effect. I'm sure people recognize those words. But in between is this phrase, um, God gives God gives us to see the right. So um, I guess I'll say, I don't know for sure, but I guess I'll say, you know, it's so it's not a common 19th century phrase, Yeah, which leads me to believe that it's Lincoln being a wordsmith and he is shaping those words. And my sense is that Lincoln is referring to a kind of interplay between God's will and human agency, mm -hmm. um, meaning that there's, you know, revelation, meaning, you know, the Bible, and then there's God provides the means, um, the means, uh, in other words, human reason, and they're, 
I mean, again, you know, Lincoln's quite a brilliant um, crafter of phrases. Yes. So my sense is God gives us to see the right is, is such a, and it may be that a theologian would correct me. So I'm speaking as a historian and as someone who studied Lincoln, um, but that he's, he's pointing to um, both reconciliation to God's will and also human action and human, um, the decisions of, of humanity, of men and women to do what they think is right. Um, and we know what Lincoln obviously thinks is right at this point. So right. quite fascinating, small group of words there. Right, right. And the recognition that perhaps humans don't always, aren't always capable of seeing what's right or knowing what's right or agreeing on what's right. Um, but as as we we have the ability to maybe see it if we turn our gaze in the right direction and comprehend it fully, um, but that's sometimes an acknowledgement that, that we don't always uh, see the right, even with, when it's right in front of our faces. Um, it's one of those, those fascinating things to me. Um, and I'll say as we um, we have about 10 more minutes or so as we wrap up with a couple more questions, if folks at home watching have any questions um, for Dr. Hodes, please feel free to write them into the comment box and we'll be happy to include you in the conversation. Um, to get to that, again, more famous phrase that follows the uh, God gives us to see the right phrase uh, is this point uh, that he closes with. Um, by saying, uh, uh, basically, uh, we need to uh, achieve a just and lasting peace. Uh, and my question is, for 19th century Americans, on the one hand to say, with malice toward none and charity to all, and we need to achieve, make sure that, you know, we finish this unfinished work that you referred to, and achieve this just and lasting peace. From your research, do you think 19th century Americans at this particular moment in time, right after the assassination, thought that both of those were possible? I mean, it's hard to answer that question without the pessimism of the 21st century. Right. Or this moment. I think people were inspired by Lincoln's words when he was reelected as the war, you know, as the Union was winning the war. So we have to remember that moment, the inaugural, the inaugurations in, in 1865 took place in March, not in January, as they do now. So it was March 1865, and the Confederacy was losing the war, and the Union was winning the war. And so there was a sense of, there was an incredible sense of optimism, um, and a sense of optimism that, that even outlasted the assassination. When I say outlasted, I mean immediately after the assassination that, you know, Confederates would come around and they would see the um, the errors of their ways. Although there were plenty of people who understood that was not true and foremost among them were African-Americans, both Northern and Southern. Um, Frederick Douglass had a very vivid phrase he used in a speech um, after Confederate surrender um, where he, I won't get it exactly right, but he said that the hatred of Confederates toward African Americans is, in, in, he did use the word intenser and the, and the word fiercer than ever before. So Douglas understood, as, as did many of um, many African Americans, both enslaved and free, um, that the end of slavery brought, brought an incredible um, anger and vengeance mm -hmm. on the part of white Southerners and, and especially former slave owners. So I think um, it's so fascinating. I mean, on the one hand, as I said earlier, people would make statements about a unified nation, but it was so clearly not a time of unity and closure at the end of the war, even before the assassination and more so afterwards. I mean, people saw all of these conflicts, not just in Union occupied Southern cities yeah. and towns, but, but in the North, you know, fights breaking out on the street between Copperheads and Lincoln's mourners. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I think what did people want? African-Americans and their allies imagined citizenship, land, education, voting rights for black men, and of course, all with, with federal enforcement. Right. Former Confederates imagine the renewal of black subjugation, 
um, and no federal interference. So how much more irreconcilable visions could you get? Hardly, right. I can't imagine more ir irreconcilable visions. So I, I mean, I don't, I, it's beautiful that, that Lincoln said those words in March, 1865 and Douglas picked up those words, Frederick Douglas. And then, you know, there are even echoes of Lincoln and Douglas's words in the, in the phrase, the contemporary phrase, no justice, no peace. Right. So if it's, you know, if they're, if the, the peace is not just and lasting, it's, it's not good enough, not good enough for Lincoln, not good enough for African-Americans, not good enough for abolitionists, black and white. Um, right. So very puzzling, very puzzling, right. very unknown. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, a great response. I mean, I, I always hate to play counterfactual history to say, as you said, oh, if Lincoln had survived, would, would the peace have have been quicker? Would the justice have been quicker? Would the two of those things been able to to be blended? And of course, we'll we'll never know. Um, but it is fascinating to, to kind of think about what 19th century Americans had the ability to, to see or or envision in their minds, what, what they could what was within the, the parameters or the boundaries of their um, kind of imagination and their perspectives about what could be achieved. We all know, of course, that slavery is, is the issue that pushes the nation into the Civil War, but it's the issue of union that most Northern soldiers are fighting for, um, as you know, Gal Gary Gallagher and, and others have written about extensively in the past several years. Um, and so there is this conundrum is that how do you bring a nation back together, especially after not only this this major, um, you know, victory of one huge army over another, but then the assassination uh, of the leader of of that victorious um, uh, group of individuals? Um, how do you bring those people back together? Is that going to be your first goal, and then you put the the justice part or the full justice behind it? Can you tackle those parts at once? And again, we'll never know exactly how Lincoln would have approached this. Um, but in a, a recent conversation um, with a professor at Gettysburg College, uh, Michael Berkner, about Eisenhower and Eisenhower's commitments um, to helping to ensure um, that desegregation would take place in certain aspects um, under, under his authority, um, but in other ways kind of playing it light on enforcing civil rights um, during, you know, in the midst of the Cold War and trying to, uh, you know, bring a nation together um, and having reunion and kind of nationalism first on the, the docket and then civil rights second. And it seems like those two are always, always at, at, play with each other in these key moments. Same with Grant's presidency. He's facing the same issues, um, obviously a lot more hard on the former Confederates than Andrew Johnson ever was. But at some point, he has to realize that he's not going to get full justice at the same time as, as he's going to get full and permanent reunion. Um, so just kind of imagining how 19th century Americans saw what was available to them on their plate or what could possibly be attained versus how they might have seen themselves as being unable in their lifetimes, at least, to achieve these two aspects, which, you know, playing historian or um, 21st century, you know, armchair historian looking back saying, well, why couldn't it be done immediately? It, it should have been very much in people's faces um, is, is, is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll just say this, um, you know, there there were people at the time and people past the moment of the assassination, who, who made the point that, you know, this terrible animosity between the, the Union and the former Confederates, the vanquished Confederates, was because of Lincoln's assassination, and right. that radical reconstruction was the vengeance um, of the North upon the White South for the assassination. But, um, uh, and I am not the only historian who makes this point, and I think this is a really important point. Um, the animosity was not the, because of the assassination. It, its roots right. were in Black freedom. Right. Um, radical reconstruction was not vengeance for the assassination. It was a response to secession, right. to war, to secession and slavery. And of course, um, the ultimate avengers were not the radical Republicans who championed black equality and the suffrage for black men. The ultimate avengers were, were the former Confederates in the era of Jim Crow. Right. So Lincoln's mourners were not the Avengers. Lincoln's antagonists ended up being the Avengers. And I think right. that's really important to, to, to see and understand in that light. Right, right, absolutely. 
Um, we have a, a question from someone about Robert and his role during the mourning process. Um, obviously, we know Mary Lincoln was overcome with grief um, throughout the entire time period and long afterward. Um, and so Robert, as the, the eldest son, um, what is his role throughout all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think Robert contended quite a bit with his mother. And as you mentioned, Ashley, Mary Lincoln was utterly distraught and devastated. Um, and also treated um, not particularly well by people surrounding her murdered husband. So, you know, for example, the night that Lincoln was shot in Ford's Theater and then moved across the street to Peterson's board, boarding house, um, Mary Lincoln was banished from the room because she was um, emoting too much. And so um, I think Robert part of Robert's role was was as much as possible for him to care for his mother. Um, I think he was also suffering quite a bit. Um, I think the Lincoln children were suffering. Um, and it, it was, and people, it was, it was also, I should just say that in people's diaries and letters about the death of Lincoln, so many people mention Mrs., as they call her, Mrs. Lincoln and the children. Constantly poor Mrs. Lincoln, those poor children. Um, and of course, in the 19th century, if her father dies, you're considered an orphan. The word orphan meant you didn't have a father. Those poor orphaned, you know, poor orphaned Robert. So I think, um, I mean, Robert's a bit of an enigmatic figure, but um, I do think, and of course, he, he had a very contentious relationship with his mother much later when he committed her to an asylum. Um, right. A very complicated story and a very complicated family. But I think in the immediate aftermath, um, you know, Mary Lincoln wouldn't ride the funeral train. She wouldn't go to the to the um, to the burial in Springfield. And um, my guess is that is that Robert Lincoln was, you know, had his hands full um, trying to be the eldest son, which must have been very difficult. And of course, he had lost his father. Sure, sure. In terms of um, when the the conspirators or when many of the conspirators are finally tried and and then hung, what part does that play in how Lincoln's mourners? either was that a balm to kind of soothe some of the grief? Was it just a temporary kind of moment of vengeance? Um, what What is the impact on uh, on that, of that moment on these people? Yeah, Again, I mean, knowing think, that it's a wide array of people that we're talking about. Right. Here. I think there was a way in which, um, <coughs> excuse me, the union victors were ultimately eager to look forward to the future of the nation. That could not have been said about Confederates. All Confederates wanted to, to do was look back right. and they wish they could turn time around and go back to a world of enslavement. But, you know, the victors did want to look forward. And my book, my book focuses on literally the hours, days and weeks after the assassination. And it ends at this moment um, where the conspirators are tried and, um, you know, it's a public spectacle. And I do feel like people were ready to move forward. So if, if you were mourning Lincoln and you were um, responding to the end of the institution of slavery, yeah. then you, you wanted the nation to heal and you wanted to go forward. And so there was a way in which that was a marker for many of the mourners, which of course was not true for Lincoln's family, just to bring it back to Mary and Robert. Um, once again, but it was true. So I'll, I'll just say one thing here. It, that was a marker for getting past the assassination. But we can't forget that every family knew someone who had died in the Civil War. If it wasn't your own father, brother, um, or son, it was a neighbor or a close friend or a cousin. And so those were the deaths people did not get over. Um, those were the really intimate personal losses. But there was a way in which, although people thought of Lincoln as a father, he was a public figure. And there was a moment in, pe in which people were willing and wanted to, and it sounds terrible to say this, but, but put it behind them and move the yeah. nation forward with Union victory. Yeah, yeah. And that reminds me of another question I, I had wanted to ask you, particularly about the, the Brown family from Salem, uh, Massachusetts, and the death of Nellie Brown, which occurs, is that 1864 is when that's right. she mm -hmm. passes? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's one of the daughters uh, uh, in the, the family, one of the two families that um, Martha talks about in her book. And you talk about how um, in the years that follow, uh, Nellie's mom always 
mark, she pauses on the anniversary of her daughter's death and she remarks on it, she reflects on it. And that's not necessarily the case with, with Lincoln's assassination, at least for her, because she has this other more intimate um, death anniversary that she feels compelled to mark. I, I'm curious in your, your findings about um, other families, how far into the future were you able to track down? I know you were trying to focus on just a specific, a shorter amount of time um, after Lincoln's assassination, but maybe in other research that you've done on this, how far into the future were people pausing on the 14th and the 15th mm -hmm. to think about this or to reflect or have a day of, of mourning? I mean, obviously, again, going back to 9-11, every year people stop. And we have, you know, we know the exact times of when, you know, each of the buildings was hit or each each of the, the towers fell or the plane in Shanksville went down. Um, it's different for us today, I guess, than for, for 19th century Americans. Or, or is that not the case? Were there a lot of people who every April 15th would say, this is you my know, day? I did, so you were mentioning, um, Ashley, this woman, Sarah Brown, this white woman from an abolitionist, a white abolitionist from Massachusetts who, who I follow through the book. And I did follow, she kept diaries all the way through the 19th century. And I did look all the way, all the way up to at least 1900 or maybe, maybe I'm not sure, I don't remember now what, what year she died. But anyway, I followed her diaries up a long, long time. Yeah. And she always marked her daughter's death. And after a short while, she stopped marking um, the anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. And I, I also looked through newspapers and I was surprised that there weren't as many markers as I imagined. I think um, 1909, which was the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's birth, was yeah. a huge renaissance of Lincoln memory. But I do want to say something really important, which is African-American families who also lost soldiers in the war. Um, it's, a, it's a complex mix. So on the one hand, the, the men they lost in the war had been fighting for, for freedom. If, you know, if they were Northern soldiers and for the freedom of their brothers and sisters in the South. Um, but but they, they also, those relatives also never got over those losses, even though their relatives had fallen for such a, an unbelievable and incredible and amazing cause. Right. Um, so, and I also, you know, I found these incredible interviews with former slaves from the Works Progress Administration, um, which were done in the 1930s, which meant that the in, people had been enslaved as children, and then they were yeah. they were elderly in the 1930s, and they all spoke of Lincoln and all remembered his. Not, I shouldn't say all, but many of them um, remarked on Lincoln's assassination. So I think it it lived for a long time in the minds of African-Americans who connected Lincoln to black freedom. But that doesn't mean that African-Americans were somehow glad to sacrifice their loved ones. Right. It's so complicated. I mean, it's it's human emotion and, and grief. And, right. um, you know, we, sh we shouldn't assume that, you know, they were just fine with that sacrifice because they, they suffered right. so terribly from those losses. Um, and of course, Lincoln's memory has gone through many iterations, including yes. during the civil rights movement of the 20th century, sure. a diminishment um, and a sense that he wasn't radical enough. Right. Um, and, and those, you know, those kinds of, um, and of course, now there has been, there has been um, right. some protesters who have wanted to remove the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, DC, because it's a statue of Lincoln with a kneeling slave. Right. Um, who, a man whose chains are broken and, you know, he's gazing off into the distance. He's not gazing adoringly at Lincoln. And both, uh, I mean, African-American scholars and white scholars have been on both sides and said, no, don't, you know, let's not forget that it was African-Americans who funded that statue, that memorial, and who yeah. celebrated that memorial when it was unveiled in, in um, 1865. So, or I'm sorry, in 1876 and Frederick Douglass gave an incredible speech at that unveiling. And this is actually a perfect ending yeah. Um, in which Douglas, and of course he would be the one to do it because he was so brilliant, um, he gave the most nuanced um, memorial to Lincoln and one that we can still live by today, where he made very clear that um, Lincoln was what he called the white man's president. Mm -hmm. And then Douglas goes back and says, you know, in the context of the time in which Lincoln lived, his death was a calamity for African-American people. And he also, you know, makes very clear that Lincoln was um, deeply dedicated to black freedom. So he was both, he was not radical enough and he was incredibly radical for the time in which he lived. And it, you know, Douglas's assessment still stands so, um, so resolutely and so beautifully. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, that is that is a perfect way to wrap up because you're highlighting, of course, the various dimensions of Lincoln himself, uh, which brings us back to, again, this just this kaleidoscope of people and communities that you're bringing into conversation um, about the topic of Lincoln's assassination, which, again, I always caution students uh, when we're working on research projects or interpretive projects. Um, that there is no one North, there is no one South, there is no one the African American community at any point in time. There are so many different communities and individuals within communities um, that have different interests and different um, identities or they identify with, with certain interests um, or groups of people more than others. And, and that's what you're really highlighting uh, for us with, with Morning Lincoln um, is to take a much more nuanced look at not only these diverse emotions, but these diverse communities and different interests and different understandings about what could be done, what was possible in the wake of, of course, a, a calamity such as the assassination, but also uh, the end of the Civil War. Um, and, and bringing all of those threads into conversation with each other is, again, the, the heart of history. So again, for those of you listening, if you want a brilliant historiographical intervention into popular understandings of what post-assassination America was like uh, in 1865, but you still want to have an accessible book, a book that humanizes these communities, a book that gets to the heart of these different emotions and these interests. Uh, it's definitely uh, Morning Lincoln. There are reasons why this book won the Lincoln Prize uh, in 2016. Um, just excellently well done. And as you can tell, um, Dr. Hodes is a, a wealth of, of information, not only about Lincoln, but the 19th century and these uh, very complex racial issues and, and political issues as well. Um, so Martha, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time again, knowing just how very busy you are. Um, and all of the, the knowledge uh, that you have, you've brought to us tonight. Uh, we really enjoy this. And I will note that um, after this conversation, we will archive uh, this recording and put it up on our YouTube page for people who are unable to watch uh, this evening or who might want to go back uh, to certain parts of it to rewatch again. So thank you all for, for joining us this, this evening. We have one more conversation with the Lincoln Scholar scheduled for December. We don't have the exact date yet, but it will be with Harold Holzer, who, of course, when you think of Lincoln, you often think of Harold Holzer uh, as one of the premier Lincoln historians of our time. And so we'll be wrapping up uh, our quarterly conversations for 2021 with Harold Holzer, and we will have a date coming out for that soon, uh, but that is this December. So thank you, Martha. Thank you so much, Ashley, for this wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone, take care. Bye-bye.